Right, hey all. Uh, put my glasses on, make me look more clever. Um, and so I can actually see this terrible screen. Um, hey, you're late. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Aha, brilliant. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Rob Oldfield. Been working here for probably too long. Um, and I'm going to follow on from a talk that Ben Shirley did. I don't know if anybody was here for that, where he was talking about um, taking a, um, a research project and actually that sort of journey through to what would it look like for that to become commercialised and that the sort of treacherous route through patents and everything. So um, along with Ben, I'm a director of this company, Salsa Sound. And so I wanted to, basically Ben stole my talk. So I was <laughs> like, that was what I was supposed to do. He's got other research interests that he could have done, but no, he stole mine. So um, hopefully I'll give you a bit more of a flavor of, of like what's behind Salsa Sound, a bit more about some of the tech, and then I'm gonna want some help moving forward, so if any advice uh, and guidance, if you think, do you know what, you could make this better by doing da da da, that's why I'm here. <laughs> and uh, so that would be great. And I'm gonna have this illustrated with Mr. Men characters because that's my bedtime reading at the minute because I've got young children. So keep it fresh. Anybody know who that is? Six. Little Miss something. something. You're correct. You're, get, you're going to struggle with this uh, exercise because there are a few that I'll be testing you on. That's Little Miss Curious. So you can see the link with them. Um, so uh, this is where we're going. Just a quick recap of what Ben said um, if for people who weren't here and just as a bit of a reminder. And I want to talk a bit more about what we are trying to do as a spin-out company and why. As part of that, we're going to have a look at a bit of the sort of what is a normal broadcast uh, practice and how can we make that sort of better by doing the salsa as I've termed it and then I want to talk a bit more about um, the technology what's what's actually behind it and um, how have we made improvements then the what's next and uh, I'm gonna sort of conclude with um, s telling you some stuff that I've learned and that we as uh, sort of very, very new spin-out company I've learnt, which hopefully might be beneficial to all and sundry. So that's Mr. Daydream. Um, so what we're trying to achieve is basically because I don't have enough stock images to go with my presentation, so I have to use things like Mr. Main Characters to keep it, keep it fresh. So what we're trying to do as uh, a company is address a problem that we see in sports broadcast, which is that the mixes are getting less and less good quality, basically. So the budgets are always going through the floor and expectations are always going through the roof. And so we wanted to use audio expertise to actually address that and bring better um, audio mixes, making it more engaging, more immersive, and hopefully more cinematic so that no longer will you see the events on the field of play and not hear them, but actually, yeah, you'll get the full picture as if you're on the field with the players and experiencing it live. So we sort of want to bring industry practices a bit more up to date, a bit more cutting edge, because it's very, very um, archaic in a way, in, in the way that um, live sports mixing is done. And when I was sat in an OB truck trying to figure out um, how things are done, I thought, no, nah, this is this is old school, we need to move into the, to the new era, particularly if we want to go down an object-based audio route. And if you want to do that, you have to embrace new practices because the current workflows don't facilitate object-based audio very well. And um, so that's, that's one of the ways that we're hoping to uh, sort of address the market and bring these tools basically to make it easier for broadcasters to adopt object-based audio. But what we're trying to do is disrupting without disrupting. So you want to like bring disruptive technologies into the marketplace without people being so freaked out that you're doing something new that they bin you off before you even get there. So that's what I mean by disrupting without disrupting, without annoying people too much. And obviously being audio minded, we want to use the 
audio sensors, audio microphones, um, because they are essentially really readily available and they're actually really data rich. So we always think of microphones as being an audio capture device, but what if we also, as well as that, saw them as sensors, things that are giving us information about the current context, which could helpfully, hopefully feed into other areas of the broadcast workflow and hopefully add value more to just the mixing desk, but to the whole um, chain of events. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we move on. Oh yes, these slides have saved in an odd manner. <laughs> Mr. Greedy, because we want it all. And I like to think of object audio as being a bit like a meal. So if you think of like channel-based audio, somebody gives you a meal, it's already on a plate. If you don't like mushrooms, it's too bad. There's mushrooms on the plate. I like to think of object audio as a recipe plus a set of ingredients. And if you don't like mushrooms, you leave the mushrooms out. So Mr. Greedy, for me, epitomizes object-based <laughs> audio. So excuse that. So um, where's my channel-based one gone? Yeah, this is what we're trying to achieve with object-based audio, Mr. Perfect. Um, so all of our channels going in as separate audio streams, we keep them alive. Um, so that the mixing can happen at the user end. It's not like a one-size-fits-all kind of thing, like, for example, channel-based audio, where your microphones come in, the producer makes one mix, and it goes to the, the listeners. This isn't so good, um, because it means if you've got different audio setups, you're screwed, basically, because all you get is a stereo. If you've got an Ambisonics rig or you know a 22.2 rig or whatever, you're not facilitated by this, so the broadcasters have to essentially push out different mix for, for different formats. So you can see how that is uh, not a sustainable model, hence why I want to go towards the object-based world, where actually if you have all of your um, ingredients and a recipe, it allows the user to put everything together at their home um, system, which means they can personalise, interact, and all that kind of stuff. But the channel base is essentially, like I say, not scalable. You, you have to produce multiple mixes, Mr. Impossible. Um, and there's basically no uh, ability to interact or personalize with your content. Um, so um, it's not quite so good. So I'm not specifically looking at object-based audio, but I want you to know that so that was a main driver for us in order to get here and actually it was in doing the object-based audio stuff that we stumbled across, if I can say that, tools that fit in with the current workflows as well. And so that's what I was saying about disrupting without disrupting. We're sort of bringing a technology for the future but also recognising where the industry is at the minute so that we can sort of gradually transition people into our dream world paradise of object-based audio. So, um, hey John. I spent quite a long time when we, when we started off doing this um, on a Fascinate project, hanging out in an outside broadcast truck, just a big lorry out with a satellite dish on outside um, football stadium, where the guy is essentially trying to mix a match. So this is an example of uh, an OB truck where a guy's, I mean, I don't even, haven't really looked, there's the audio desk. Tiny, tiny room where they're trying to mix 5.1 where you've got speakers like here and here and here. And now they're trying to do Atmos where you've got a speaker there. So it's like ridiculously tiny space. Very much got these practical constraints on what, what can actually be achieved. But what they're trying to achieve when they're mixing, for example, a football game and make way for a cheesy animation coming up, um, is essentially to try and capture these on-pitch sources but suppress the crowd noise. If you push, oh, so these are microphones, there's generally 12 microphones around the actual pitch and if you push all of those microphones high up in in the mix all you get is just horrendous crowd noise. You get people swearing and rather than being able to hear everything that's going on the pitch you actually hear nothing that's going on on the pitch and you have have difficulties as well where this side of the uh, crowd are cheering for one team and that side are cheering for the other so you just get this horrible mush. So what the engineers generally do is they basically 
in a Mr. Tickle-like fashion, they control the faders of a mixing console the, throughout the whole match. So if the ball goes near microphone 9, he pushes microphone 9 up, and then when he then gets kicked to 11, he pulls that one down and pushes that one up. So his entire attention is spent trying to capture the on-pitch sounds. And you can imagine, therefore, if he's sat there and if he's the only sound supervisor in the truck, which is quite common these days, he doesn't have any ability to do anything else. So every time he wants to monitor what the output mix is, which could be 5.1 stereo, another 5.1, and then potentially other formats as well, he then can't do this procedure of trying to capture the on-pitch sounds. So you get a scenario where, or if somebody comes in with a cup of tea, he could miss referee blowing his whistle, or he could miss the goalkeeper kicking the ball, which essentially is missing out on the narrative of the game. And essentially it's about storytelling. How can we tell the story of what's going on on the field in a better way that engages the audience? Because um, Sky, BT or whatever, they're paying nearly 10 million quid per Premier League match. So it's quite important to them that they retain their, their viewership. And so adding the excitement into the game is important. So anyway, this is, let me see if this actually works. And there's no audio, so it won't be that great. So what, <laughs> what you want to see and what you would hear is these are some characters. We've got Beckham versus George Best and Messi and a few others that you may or may not recognise if you're a football fan. Um, okay, so fader goes up, audio signal goes in, fader goes up, audio signal goes in. And see what's happened there? You couldn't hear, and you wouldn't have been able to hear even if I'd have had audio, that the referee blew his whistle because Joey Barton had punched Wayne Rooney, which I think is a highly uh, realistic situation. Because the, you can't, the engineer can't focus on two things at once. He's trying to capture what's going on with Pele and George Best. And so he's essentially missed it. And this happens actually all the time. And the other thing that happens is when that fader goes up and then someone boots the ball over to that side and that fader goes up, you can, if you watch Match of the Day and you start actually listening to this, you can hear the timbre of the soundstage completely shifts because they raise one fader and then up in the other one. And these ones are cheering for Palace and the other ones are cheering for United or something. It's, it doesn't sound consistent. And so this is something that uh, bothers the engineers not only because it's a difficult task but also because the results are getting worse because there are more and more uh, there's more and more strain on their jobs essentially so live sound difficult to produce and as i said on pitch events are being being missed and essentially it's just less engaging if you're not hearing what's going on on the field it's harder to fully engage with the content take it to the extreme you turn the audio off boring um, in my opinion um, and additionally, there's, there's nothing object-based about what's going on. There's no metadata being generated. Nobody knows where the referee is when he blew his whistle or where any of the audio events, the ball kicks or players shouting, whatever. Nobody knows where they occurred. So again, we've got all of these sensors around the field, but we're not using them. We're not actually getting any value from these microphones that are all, all the way around. Also, uh, expletives creep in. Uh, I, obviously, this is not an 18 rated seminar, so I won't play you the, uh, the content, but there's a lot of examples of either members of the crowd or players shouting and then they get picked up by their pitch side mics and then basically Ofcom get really shirty with the broadcasters and threaten to find them or what have you. So that's a big problem that we've uh, addressed as well. Um, and then the other thing, this is linked to what I'll talk about later. The, during a match, there's people who are tagging events all the time. They're just basically with an well, XML or an Excel sheet tagging when key events have happened. Sort of like, you know, Wayne Rooney kicks the ball up the line, you know, some such and such saves or, or whatever. And this is all used, it's all pulled together for these um, highlight creation packages uh, or slow-mos or whatever you, what have you. And there's literally, if you go and there's about five people just like frantically scribbling down or typing down what's going on in the match. So they're basically trying to create metadata manually, but it seems to me that that is A, inaccurate, and B, 
ridiculously labor intensive. So what we're trying to do is use the audio content to be able to create some of that metadata in an automated fashion to add um, more, more data streams to make the highlight creation a bit easier. So doing the salsa, uh, I'm not going to do an example because I can't. Um, I should have really stuck with a hot and spicy type of salsa because I, I can eat. Um, so this is our solution to, to some of the problems. I didn't bring a box today because I've hurt my shoulder and I didn't want to carry a million things. But um, this is our hardware box. Essentially we have all of our microphones or sensors as I'm beginning to call them coming into this box and then it uses an AI engine basically to pick out the events that are salient in the context and then create um, a mix of the on-pitch sounds which are then combined with the crowd sound from a sound field mic high up in the stadium so that's a very controlled um, sound stage rather than having the, the sort of transient fluctuations of people in the crowd when it's high up you get that kind of <laughs> which people want, it's a bit more immersive. And it means that your, the level of your crowd noise doesn't suddenly shoot through the roof when there's a goal scored and then drop down into the noise floor when there's nothing going on. So we mix our pitch side mix with the 5.1 to produce a brilliant automated mix. And whilst doing that, we've got a lot of, um, we're able to tag the event type, duration, signal stats, and importantly, the location because of all the analysis that we've done within the box. Um, so that is fundamentally our, our audio mixing solution. So the, I can't remember who that is. Mr. Clever, did you get it? Oh yeah, Mr. Boffin, there we go, that'll do. Mr. Clever, um, don't know whether it's clever, but anyway, he can represent this slide for us. So we're basically listening, the, all the mic feeds come into our box and our algorithm's listening for specific types of event. So we have a set of audio templates that it's essentially looking for or listening for. And then it's, it uses that information to create an automatic mix and to enhance that mix. We actually have started uh, triggering like pre-produced samples so that you can have a completely clean on-pitch mix, which is just the actual on-pitched audio events rather than the rather than having like a background noise um, but we'll talk about that so we have a discrete sound sources that are tagged with um, metadata of location and because we're triggering samples it means we've got rid of all of those expletives when people shout into the microphone because it's not about trying to remove sound sources it's about trying to add sound sources in so if you said to me I want an algorithm to get rid of swear words. The first thing you think about was, oh right, okay, I've got to have some kind of engine that recognizes all the swear words right across the world. And then when it recognizes them, we'll have to delete them from, it'd be totally impossible. Specifically in uh, sort of this kind of environment where it's really, really high noise and you've got up to 80,000 men screaming um, into microphones to some extent. It's, we've had to think, a bit differently about the way that we do things because a lot of your classical sort of DSP essentially breaks down in those kind of conditions so sometimes you have to just think a bit more sort of pragmatically about how things um, can and, and uh, can't be done but because we've got this completely silent stream that's punctuated by the ball kicks and the whistleblow events it means that we're no longer the, the way that it's currently mixed is you have the crowd in your surround speakers and then the commentary and the pitch effects front center. So um, if it's 5-1, you'd have your crowd in the, the stereo and then a phantom source of the commentator and the, uh, the ball kicks. Well, what happens in that scenario is that because your uh, pitch effects have got so much crowd noise on, actually it squashes your whole sound stage into the middle because you're essentially mixing the crowd into the middle so it, it folds it in a bit so if you can get rid of the crowd noise from your pitch side mix it means you open it up again and then you get that spatial sense feeling like you're actually there because it's it's an immersive uh, sound stage basically so 
Um, yes, sorry, one of the other problems that I addressed um, that I didn't mention is that broadcasters have started investing in, they've suddenly realised, well, we've been investing loads of money in, in all these videos, this like HDR or UHD content, but we haven't done a lot in audio. So they've ploughed some money into Dolby Atmos, but what they haven't really thought about is that essentially only 0.001% of their viewership has any kind of Dolby Atmos ability at all. So they've put all of this money for like tiny, less than a thousand people, I think they said, have got a Dolby Atmos system and they've invested, you know, millions of quid in it. But you, if you don't have an Atmos system, won't notice any different when you watch that content. So what we're doing is addressing it at the production end rather than the reproduction end. So if you can improve the mix at production, then it doesn't matter whether you're viewing it on your phone or over an Atmos system, you will hear an improvement in the, the sound quality. You'll start to hear all of those ball kicks, whistle blows, um, and the on-pitch events. So you'll get a better mix. So um, do the salsa. The other good thing is it's more efficient because instead of having to have a massive mixing console with your 12, mic 12 um, faders that you have to have constantly available to you, plus your 5-1 crowd, so desk that big, you could actually mix a match on a desk that was just four faders if you wanted to. You just have the automated mix from us, your crowd and your commentary feed, and you're done. It's much easier and uh, potentially space saving. And at the moment, there's a big drive to move into remote production technologies where you have essentially the, all of the production happens in say like your head studio in London and all of the things that you don't need somebody for can happen at the ground. So this is a popular solution to broadcasters because we can do the on-pitch mix for them and then send it to the production centre, which means that one person can potentially QC multiple matches rather than having to have multiple people doing one match. Uh, uh, this is the same animation but done in an object-based way, but it doesn't, it's not really going to carry because it doesn't have any audio with it. But uh, essentially we're highlighting where the, where the audio objects are in each case and it's actually picking up more than one at any one time. So because it's automated, you don't have, the engineer doesn't have to have hands in two places at one time. That's a little almost perfect. So um, what are our opportunities? Well, if we can separate out all the sources, if we know where they are on the field, then it means we can do interaction. So we can move sources around if we wanted to. So in 360 video, for example, you could actually have the on-pitch events coming from the correct place in the sound stage, which is something that BT has, um, said they're struggling with a lot. They don't know how to do that at the moment. Um, so we can obviously help them out a lot with that by putting our mix as a, an ambisonics mix so that when you rotate your head, the on-pitch sounds mix um, with you. So you can move stuff around like that change your view perspective. Personalization obviously can kind of meddle with things if you want to. If you want to have louder whistleblowers but quieter ball kicks, you could do that. You could um, potentially tag uh, visual events to audio events. So you could say every time the referee blows his whistle, say if you're in a pub, then the screen could sort of flash 10 times so everybody knows, watch this, something has just happened or it vibrates in someone's phone in their pocket or something like that. Through, you can see how the the audio analysis all of a sudden can add value to or can be useful throughout other parts of the of the broadcast um, and potentially new possibilities as they uh, as they arise so okay on to on to some of the challenges and some of the technology now so um, that's a little miss trouble because there are challenges and she's a challenging individual I'm told um, so we need to develop, we need to actually develop algorithms that do all this. It's all been a bit sort of a pie in the sky, but actually when you've got such a high noise floor with so many sort of screaming fans, how do you actually do that? Because a lot of the information is also lost because of your outdoor propagation. You're losing a lot of the sort of high frequency content 
So a lot of the acoustic signature that you would do if you were just looking at it in the audio band actually lost quite a lot of that information. Um, and so we are currently using a neural network to sort of help us out in that. Not that a neural network is a magic black box like people seem to think, but it is, it is uh, helping us at the moment. But the problem with a neural network is you have to tell it what to do, you have to teach it, and that takes blooming ages and requires a lot of content. Um, a big challenge, two big challenges are next two. It can't go wrong, so it's fine. And this is one of the big things that I've learned. It's fine doing like a little demonstrator and if it goes wrong, everyone goes, oh, isn't that cute? They're working really hard at something, but never mind. Or like, oh, that's a good, exciting work in progress. If this is to be on sort of a million viewers TVs every week, it can't go wrong. You can't have suddenly <coughs> or sort of triggering events left, right and centre that aren't correct. So that's a really big um, little Miss Trouble moment for us. And also um, for us system latency is, is an issue. It's not too much of an issue but it, everything I've discussed is all about it's kind of like retrospective mixing almost. So the audio comes in, we analyse it for certain features and then make a production decision but on a very slightly delayed version of the audio. As you can imagine you're constantly missing events because they've already happened by the time you've picked them up. So we have to apply, um, and it's about, we're down to about 80 milliseconds latency, so we're not doing too bad at the moment. And probably can't go down much further than that, so broadcasters have to either like it or lump it. The good thing is, is that you're used to that level of latency anyway, just because it takes sound longer to travel than light. So it's not, it's not the, the problem that perhaps we thought it would be. Another challenge is the we've always done it this way scenario where people kick back against disruptive technology, hence why we need to disrupt without being disruptive. Um, and yes, the last challenge is getting people to actually part with some money because at some point a business has to make money or it ceases to become a business. So, fundamentally, um, on the field, in terms of football, and we are applying this to other sports, but at the moment, um, football is the focus. There are sort of principally two types of events. There are transient events like ball kicks, crossbar hits, uh, balls bouncing, um, nasty tackles, that sort of thing. And there are the referee's whistle blow. And we treat those differently at the moment. So for the, I'll, I'll talk about them in turn. For the ball kicks and bounces, and uh, I would say transient events. They're distinguished by the fact that primarily the crowd noise is quite um, stationary in character. It doesn't have loads of transient energy. It's got that, you know, people shouting or whatever, but it's not, it doesn't contain as many transient events. So we're sort of um, monopolizing that, particularly at the, the low frequency. So what we did to try and detect when they're going on is to have focused quite a lot on the, the low frequency side but we have an onset detector based on sort of spectral flux technique and some enveloping in there as well that is essentially giving us onset times where transient activity has happened. Now that could still include someone banging on the on the side of a advertising hoarding or banging their chairs which happens a lot and so we get into trouble if we make this onset detector too sensitive then what happens is you end up triggering a load of false events. So you've got a choice. Do you change the threshold so that you don't pick up any false positives, but then miss loads of the true positives? Or do you lower the threshold and risk getting loads of false positives in? Or do you give up and adopt a, a neural network approach? So we set our threshold really low. So we trigger loads of events and then over 12 channels in real time, we're running a neural net, which is basically declassifying events that don't match the pattern of a kick, which are based currently on the MFCCs and the, or the, the Delta MFCCs as it's changing during time. So it's quite easy then to say, do you know what? That's not a kick. I can tell because um, 
of the change in the, the values of the MFCCs, which are quite good for being tuned to the way that we hear. So currently, that's working really nicely, and it can even so question. It can even get rid of uh, drum sounds. Uh, they are the what is the acronym? They're basically mill mill kepstrom. Yes, mill frequency kepstrom coefficient. Yeah. Um, yes. So they basically like you filter it into different bands, and then it's the kepstrom within that band that gives you these set of coefficients. Really useful for sort of um, like speech recognition and things like that. Yeah. It's a bit bit odd, isn't it? Because you're basically doing a Fourier of a Fourier inverse <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> so it's but they turn out to be super useful for sort of audio classification problems. Um, and can even sort of like distinguish between they it, it means that we can sort of distinguish between events. If you can tell the difference with your ears, then the likelihood is then our engine can also tell the difference between them as well. So we do still get into some problems where events sound almost exactly like a ball kick, or if someone was to kick a ball in a crowd, however that would happen, then we would have, we would have issues. But we're always training and training and training. So Sky Sports have been sent us I think every single match or most of the matches that they broadcast last year. So we have all of the mic feeds for that. So when I'm having a lazy, boring moment, I'm just tagging all this data to teach our neural net to basically just get better and better and better so that we can pick up those kicks in the middle of the field. Because even with the best sound mixer possible, when he's raising and lowering the faders, sometimes those events in the middle of the field, you, you can barely hear them even though they are just they are just there but if you adopt this approach you detect it and then instead of raising the fader up you actually trigger um, an event instead and then you get sort of it puts the life back into the broadcast and where you've lost all that high frequency energy you can put it back so um the other sound source that we go after are the whistleblows. These are actually well, quite a lot easier, really, even if you've got people whistling in the crowd, because the referee's whistle's got a very unique sort of harmonic structure to it, and they're all tuned at about 3.5 to 4K. So actually, when you do this, if you look at um, a Kepstrom in narrow bands, so Kepstrom being the Fourier transform of the absolute Fourier transform, so it's... Uh, Basically, if you, did a, if you do a Fourier and you get a set of peaks, then it's looking at what's the period of those peaks by taking a Fourier transform of it. So if you get a big spike in the Kepstrom, it means that you've got a lot of harmonic energy. And then if you were to narrow down where you're looking to the four kilohertz band, then you can pick out exactly when these happen. And it's, it's almost, almost sort of like bulletproof in its ability to do that. And Actually, the microphones are really sensitive to picking up uh, the referee's whistle blows anyway. So when they detect it, we have a um, sort of attack and release envelope. So we just raise the fader and then gradually tail it off so you don't notice that we've, that we've done it. So that's what's, what's going on um, with the whistle blows. And we, we keep them as separate channels so that you can process them differently or you can analyze them differently um, moving forward. So the the sound engineer would have access to a ball kicks channel and a whistle blows channel. And um, he can do with as he wishes or she wishes. So the next part of, of what we're doing is um, the creation of the metadata. So at first I thought, oh, brilliant. We, we can do a cross correlation between all of our different microphones and then we'll know where all the sound sources are, which is great in theory. But then when you have like an 80 dB noise floor, 90 dB noise, turns out it doesn't work. You can't do a cross correlation in such a noisy environment. So cheated a little bit by actually when you detect an event, you can then scrutinize the other microphones in that vicinity to see whether they detected the same event. And if they did, you look at the timestamp of when that detection happened. And then that gives you your time difference of arrival at the different microphones. And the beauty is, is once you've detected an event, 
and you're sure of it in one mic, you can actually lower the threshold right down to look in the other ones to make sure that you capture it on multiple mics rather than just one. And then it's essentially just a sort of triangulation problem where you know if for every two mics you have a, set, a couple of hyperbole on where that source might be. Um, and if you sort of do a bit of a um, coordinate shift transform, then you can eliminate the other hyperbole so you know it's somewhere along here. And then when you have a second uh, pair of microphones, i.e. three microphones, then you'll end up with two that overlap that will then tell you where your sound source is which was the way that I initially did it and um, got into loads of difficulties with and I'm sure these are probably problems that have already been solved a thousand times by people who know loads about GPS but I'm not that guy and I got into problems like this where maybe that maybe that they didn't actually overlap and so you're trying to find a you're trying to find an overlap in two hyperbole but because of maybe it was a blustery day or something and they didn't overlap or maybe they overlap twice and then your algorithm doesn't know which point to choose so um and that, that this is sort of like a probability source map which worked quite well as well and so these are the hyperbole and then that's the spot where the source came from but then i actually that's relatively both of those methods are quite computationally inefficient and if you're trying to process 12 channels in real time with a neural net onset detector kept from it actually becomes quite tricky to fit everything into your buffer size so i went for a, a bit more of a i don't know it feels a bit naughty like it feels like a bit of a bad way of doing localization but it works really well where basically i, I split the pitch up into half meter segments and then calculated what the time difference of arrival at all 12 mics would be um, if the source were to come from there and so then when I have when I get say three um, time differences or arrivals then I basically just do a least squares fit between the ones that I've received and the theoretical ones and then it gives me the source the most likely source position which works works great and you can do it super quick and you don't get that problem of not knowing where the lines where those hyperbole cross or anything like that and then I had the idea that I chatted to Paul about um, of maybe we could, because in order for this to work, you have to know where all your microphones are, but that requires a disruption in, and I'm trying not to disrupt if you remember, because I'm asking somebody to go out and measure the places of all the mics, which they've never done previously. So I'm trying to avoid that by maybe automating uh, the whole procedure so that Maybe after a certain number of kicks, my algorithm could learn where the microphones are. I don't know where this is possible, so if anyone's got any good wisdom on this, then talk to me afterwards. But I'm, I'm, my feeling is that when a, when a ball is kicked on the field and it's picked up by three mics, there is one solution to that problem of where the source is. And there's maybe a couple of solutions of where the where the mics are but essentially there is an answer to that problem and then when it's kicked over here on the same field and it's picked up by the same three mics there is also an answer to that problem so then you've got and you've got a whole load of knowns because you've got all your time differences of arrival and then you've got four unknowns which are the microphone positions and the source positions and it seems to me that somebody more clever than me might be able to work that problem out or I might be able to figure a way of, uh, after a certain number of kicks, finding out where the microphones are and where the source was. Unless this is like some kind of problem that is, you know, just not possible. But that's, that's my next step anyway, to try and eliminate the need for anyone having to measure the mics. Because I know roughly where they are. That's the, other, that's the other key known. I know that they're within a 10 meter box um, which will help and we've got to wrap up because we're running out of time um, this is a flow diagram just to say oh crap I don't have it picked up in three mics what do I do so you have to just uh, give it an approximate position and we know roughly where the source is in terms of distance because of how much high frequency transient energy it loses so the further away it goes the less high frequency transients it contains so you know that you've got a very very rough metric of distance 
so you can sort of roughly position it along this hyperbole if you want which gives you a better a better version of it we built a box didn't bring it along but that's the 2u version and we're moving towards a 1u version so it's a bit more sleek and not so heavy for me to carry around but it also runs as a software um on what is cross-platform so it runs on pretty much anything which is handy so finally nearly next steps um always can be improvements in in the algorithms although we're happy with where we're up to pretty much um so we're going to try and push forward and see hopefully someone will buy it at some point but i know there's there's some improvements we've got some uh developers helping me with this so we still need to sort of tie up some of the development side of things we need to update our hardware to because the previous one is very sort of prototypey um we need to persuade someone to buy it else we're going to go out of business um but we've got a clear roadmap of where we want to go in terms of other sports and sort of other ideas so that hopefully we're not just a flash in the pan one idea kind of company but actually we can make a go of this and hopefully you know um salsa sound will become a not quite a household name but a broadcast house name <laughs> if that's possible um by sort of expanding into different sports because actually this concept of mixing based on analyzing the audio content i think works in loads of different genres so um yes nfl american football to the layman is is our next our next big one uh to conclude everything i just said um we're making mixing sports better um at the moment the practices are arcane and are not doing that great um and we're creating metadata which is great for object-based stuff so finally oh hello see you later mr greedy i like to finish with prince philip when he came around here because it was i did a demo when he came around as the chancellor I, no you yeah chancellor of the university i did a demo to him of some ambisonics thing that we'd like bust our gut to put together and he said to me at the end oh, it's all very well and good but what's the point of it all and I felt quite challenged because like, you know what? I'm not really sure. So one of the things that I've learned partly from that and just moving forward is to keep focus on what you're actually trying to achieve so that you've actually got, you've got a what's the point of it all? Why do you actually want to do it? Something else I've learned is that our work as a department is actually really valuable that, that, and to encourage people that we have a skill that is needed out there in the world. And actually we're doing really great cutting edge stuff that actually impacts the real world. And um, so to be encouraged and to focus on how we can sort of impact, I'm not saying everybody needs, should be starting a company or anything like that, but just to be focused on, you know what, does this have a bigger application or is it just, is it just numbers and, and MATLAB? Um, so not losing sight of the end game, I think, and remembering that actually like, business cases are important, thinking about not necessarily money, but whether it's bidding or whether it is actually trying to have a, a business case. That's how our world, unfortunately, works. And so thinking about the value of what we've got and how somebody or ourselves might want to kind of exploit that, I think is important. The last few things I learned, it takes ages to make a product. It's really difficult, it's quite fun, um, and too many prototypes spoil the broth is my way of saying sometimes you just got to get out there and take a bit of a punt and just try and, uh, you know, say that you finished. I think like us academics get obsessed with like tiny little details and never actually get it finished. So too many prototypes spoil the, the broth. And then my most important one is the thing that I've learned as an individual is that it's okay to ask for help because I think for me this whole journey of like doing a spin-out company is super daunting tons of stuff in fact like pretty much everything I don't know all of a sudden and I've embraced that um, along with the Royal Academy of Engineering who sort of mentored me I've embraced that concept of do you know what if you don't know something it, that's okay it's all right to be teachable and to ask the question of people around you who maybe do know 
So I've been asking lots of questions and I've kind of enjoyed being the idiot who doesn't know anything. And, and I have felt a bit sort of like freed up in that respect to ask questions. And we've got people on board who are better than me at stuff so that I can ask them questions and hopefully learn. So that'd be my encouragement to everybody. Just don't be afraid to ask. It's all right not to know just because you're in university. It's my deep moral ending, sorry. <laughs> I started off with Mr. Men characters and, and uh, finished with a deep moral ending. But um, yeah, cool. I think that's, that's time-wise. And if anybody wants to sort of hear it, I can set it up. But I didn't get a chance to do it before I came, so it'll just take me a little while. All right. <laughs>